Howdy folks, welcome to Camera Shake, where we bring you the insider scoop on all things photography and videography, giving you a unique opportunity to stay ahead of the curve. We spend literally hundreds of hours interviewing some of the most renowned photographers of our time, giving you access to knowledge and expertise that's not available anywhere else. I'm your host, Kirsten Nutz, and in today's episode, we'll have another super special guest to help me unravel the AI survival guide for us lowly human photographers. Oh, and we'll throw in a healthy dose of super creative infrared photography as well, right after this. Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 163. But hold on, before I tell you who our special guest is, let me just say that I'm massively proud that our friends over at Platypod have come on board to sponsor the Camera Shake podcast. I honestly couldn't be more thrilled since I've been using Platypod products like the Platypod Extreme and the Platypod Elite for some time now, and it's made my life so much easier. Platypod make the world's most compact tripods for photographers, filmmakers, and vloggers, allowing you to unlock limitless creativity and say goodbye to missed shots and restrictive rules with Platypod where innovation never sleeps. But without further ado, let's give it up for today's special guest, the incredibly talented fine art photographer, award-winning wedding photographer, educator, and generally nice guy. Give it up for Mr. Troy Miller. Troy, man, how's it going? It's good. It's good. Thank you for that introduction. That was amazing. <laughs> well, thank you for being on the show, man. I'm, I'm seriously yeah. thrilled um, to, to talk to you because your photography is really is so creative because you specialize in, I would say, well, fire and ice and kelp, which is a weird subject to photograph anyway. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, yeah. And water. And so what I want to know really is like, how, what was it that drew you to those subjects in particular? Well, it, the, the fire started first. Um, <clears throat> I, I tend to be a creative in a lot of things. Like I like to build furniture. I do pottery. There's an anvil back there. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm always like building something. <clears throat> and uh, I was in the garage one day and I was I was making rivets. And every time I fired up the torch, I was like, that looks really cool. Like, that looks really cool. Like, I got to photograph that. Like, how can I photograph fire? So spent the rest of the time in the garage working and I'm thinking like, how can I photograph that? So that's, that's kind of how the fire thing started, the torch and the sparks and, you know, all those kind of things got started. I created a couple images, entered them in competition and they went crazy. You know, they went to professional photographers of America. They went alone. They, they did really well. And I'm like, wow, this is kind of fun stuff, you know? And that was just the, that was just the path. That was just the beginning of it. That was where we, we kind of dove in and, and it's unusual. I like I like things that are that are unusual and unique. Your fire images are really interesting because it's it, it really you know when I look at those, it's I'm trying to understand that that's actually fire. You know, um, there's so many shapes and colors in there. Um, how do you photograph that? I mean, is it what is it like a a gas burner that you're photographing, or how, how does it actually work? So, um, th th what that is, is, is it's a, and I don't recommend this for anybody, by the way, this is not a, this is not a safe thing to do, <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> right. disclaimer right here. Um, so basically what it is, is it's, it's a piece of tubing that I feed propane into with an igniter. Right. And, uh, then, you know, you put a little bit of material in there. So like tungsten, a little piece of titanium, like little five, little fine grains of that, um, any high carbon steel works really good. And then you prime it with propane and then you ignite it and it, it pops. So you get this big explosion and you have to, that's what I'm photographing. So it all has to happen. You, you prepare it and it all happens in the dark. So then you open the shutter and you hope your exposure is right because a big pop is really bright and a not such a big pop, right? And so that's it. Yeah. So, and you just shot after shot after shot and you might get a good one in an evening so so do you set your shutter to bulk mode so is it like permanently open uh i set it for like a two minute um shutter release so basically i have a i have a um, remote so you just crack it fire the 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 explosion basically 
and then the shutter closes because it's in the dark. So, you know, I don't need to keep it open any longer than it takes for that explosion to happen, um, which is usually by the time I can hit the igniter and the time that it pops and the time that I can like, OK, reset. It's, uh, two minutes is is good, but really, it's probably 10 seconds, but it's just easier to do it that way. And then if I get really clever on some of the shots, you'll notice there's like a background that has a little bit of color. And that'll be like a piece of aluminum or a backboard somewhere that has like the dimmest flashlight that I could find throwing light on it just so I could get a little bit of depth, you know? So it's fun. It's very technical, very time consuming. It's what's and, amazing. Uh, I mean, the thing that amazes me is is just the the colors in it are just so striking, you know? Oh. Yeah, they're they're really wonderful. I actually did a I, I used to stream on Twitch. I actually did a stream on Twitch with it one time. And um that was tough. That was tough to stream and do that at the same time. But it's interesting to go back and look at that and actually see the steps because it it takes so long to prepare the shot just to get one shot. And then yeah. you look at the back of the camera, you're like, oh, that's overexposed. Hopefully the next <laughs> one's better. <laughs> so how many um I mean how, how many how many attempts does it usually take you to get a usable result? Hundreds. I mean, it's 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 hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I mean, I'll I'll shoot I'll shoot for days before I get one that I find to be unique or really interesting. You know, you can kind of narrow it in and get a predictable results after a little while, but then they're kind of boring. They're kind of the same. You know, it's the same the pattern. The pattern tends to repeat. And that's not what I want. You know, I want I want something that's that's unique. You know, I want a little explosion and a spark or I want a weird color. So it just takes a lot of time. So how do you adjust it that you get different um uh, different type of shapes, you know, in in those in those uh in this explosion? It depends on it depends on the pressure of of how much gas is in the pipe. Oh. So how big the pop is. So if you do, uh, I, it, it called, I call them ghosts. If it's just a really, really light amount of gas in there and you get this cloud of blue. Um, <clears throat> but if you put more gas in there, then the, then the force coming out the end is even greater. And that's what shoots the sparks out. And that's what gives it that sort of streaked effect. And th the way that you control it is you just hope, you know, you, you put in the right material and you hope that you get the colors that you want. I've tried manipulating the colors and, and it, it doesn't really work really well with different like little chemicals and things that burn different colors or uh, uh, like the firewood, you know, packets you can get like that doesn't work. You know, it, it, it all happens so fast. So. Did you ever get burned? <laughs> um, I only got, well, not really. I only got burned when I actually the slight burn when I touched the tubing after shooting for a long time and I was cleaning up and it was just like, OK, that was that was stupid. Like there was fire here. Um, but but I do wear like I, I do wear a full face shield when I'm doing that because I don't want any of these little particles coming back into my face. And the camera is usually on. A, I have 105 uh, macro. And so it's maybe two feet away three feet away from from the subject so the the camera's pretty safe um but it's it's just one of those kind of things that i look at and think like okay well that's that's really hard to photograph that's what i want to go play with yeah yeah i mean it's, it's still you know it's it's super interesting because it is every result is or every image is unique in a in a way because you, you right. can never reproduce that in a sense and that's i think that's just that's really what's so stunning about all of these Thank you. Yeah, it's it's really fun. And as you go back and because I started shooting these, uh, I think I, I started with like the D4, the Nikon D4, and then I got a D850. And every iteration of camera has given me better results, you know, because the tonal range and the tonal values and the, 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 the ability to capture subtle colors has improved. And, you know, now with like the Z8 or the Z9, um, or any of the Z cameras, really, the sensors are just phenomenal. I'm, I'm seeing different colors now, like more subtle purples and magentas. And so I'm like, can't wait to go do it again. I haven't shot it in a long time, but. When talking about color, you know what I find super fascinating about your eyes uh, images as well is just the, the, the color tones in there. It's, the shapes are somewhat like alien, which is like, I think with, with a lot of those images, you know, you got to look really hard to, re to understand 
logically that that's actually ice that you're looking at because the shapes look so like that might as well be an alien planet. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's the, that's the fun of it, right? I mean, we're surrounded by uh, objects that we easily recognize, and then if we pull back enough or we or we push in enough, then they become unique and different. And that's what I'm so attracted to is 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 that that ability to be unique and different. And as a wedding photographer, I'm out in the world all the time photographing people. This is the ice and the fire and the glow stick stuff and all that. Like I can do all that in a garage and I can just walk away from it. You know, if if I need to, if I need to refill on my beverage or I can listen to whatever music I want. So it's like my own little creative world. And I like diving into those things and trying to create something that that looks unique. Yeah, you know, I feel the same way uh, about selfies, weirdly enough. Um, and I mean, I, I call them selfies, but it's elaborate self portraits, you know, um, because as a portrait photographer, you know, I, I shoot people all day long, you know, headshots, right. corporate headshots, you know, business portraits, blah, blah, blah. Um, but of course you're always under pressure cause you're always working against the clock, you know, and it's always a client to satisfy and you're always shooting to a brief of some description or whatever. But when it comes to self portraits, you can do whatever you want for however long you want. You can be as crazy right. as you want. You can you know, experiment, you can try different things. Um, and it's, I, I love doing those. Um, and of course I did a lot of those during the pandemic, clearly because, you know, back then it was, over here in the UK, it was outright illegal <laughs> not to photograph other humans because you weren't allowed to be in any, you know, in the vicinity of anybody, anybody else right. all the time. Right. Yeah. Any, anytime that you can, you know, be creative in a space that's controlled without constraints, I tend to think that I, I, for me, I, I, I come up with better ideas, you know, and that helps me do better when I'm on a shoot and I'm out in the world and I've got to shoot quickly. I'm like, Oh, look at the light coming through that tree. Like, that's awesome. I could use that kind of the same way I lit this thing shooting macro, right? Like I can highlight just the hands or just the mask of the face and do something weird with it. You know, client may not like it, but they might, they might, you know, and I get to play. Yeah, exactly. That's, but that's, that's the fun part of, um, you know, of, of having the, the time and the space and the ability to be, you know, to be creative and use that creativity. Right. Um, right. I mean, the other thing that's, that's really fascinating me about your photographer in particular, and this is because I completely do not understand it, is infrared photography. Um, I, I feel like we should do, at some point, we should do a whole episode just solely about infrared photography. Um, but for now, what is infrared photography and how the hell does it work? <laughs> um, so I'm obsessed uh, with infrared photography. Um, once I was introduced to it by a friend of mine, uh, it, it was hard not to fall in love with it. <clears throat> so in normal daylight, we have a spectrum of light that the human eye can see. Infrared, ultraviolet, <clears throat> they're in a spectrum that we really can't see. And the infrared cameras are sensitive enough to the point that they can actually see that light. And you have to convert your camera. So basically, they, they put a filter over the sensor. Um, and so it becomes sensitive to infrared. And then when you look through the camera, it's like it's like seeing a whole nother version of our world that we've never seen before. And I just love that. And infrared light is a, a deeper penetrating light. So it enters the leaves, it enters the water, it enters objects, it enters our skin, and it reflects out. And because the camera is sensitive to it, you expose for the infrared intensity as opposed to like the visual light intensity. So it's it's very different. It's not like the infrared you see in the movies where they put on the goggles and they can see in the dark. It's not that you need you need light from the sun in order to in order to photograph with it. So this isn't like a night vision camera. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. No. And that's, that's, I think like a, a lot of new newbies that get into infrared, they tend to think like, oh, this is going to be great. I can shoot in the dark. And like, no, you need, you need an infrared light source, which luckily we have the sun. So we have this amazing infrared light source. So that's actually a good point. I mean, basically what you're saying is infrared photography really <clears throat> only works in daylight, essentially, rather than, rather than at nighttime. Um, 
Yes and no. So it depends on it depends on the conversion that you do. And I, I won't get too geeky in it, but like you can have a camera converted at different nanometers. So like 850 nanometers is more strict. So it will it will cut off visual light more often. You can go all the way down to like, well, they they vary, but my favorite is like 720 nanometers because it picks up a little visual light and a lot of infrared. So I can shoot in normal light. Like there's there's really no infrared light coming in off this LED light panel, but I could still use it um, with with the conversion that I have. So it depends on the conversion. You know, there's a lot to there's a lot to think about. Like, what am I going to use it for? So, and then editing the image later, that's a whole nother process. Yeah, I mean that's actually that's an interesting point um, because there's this not only the shooting part, but then there's this post-production part. What, what is it that you have to do? I mean, actually, there's two questions in there. First of all, I'm sort of wondering, you know, you said you have your camera converted. There's a filter that um, gets attached to the to the sensor. How, what mm -hmm. effect does it have on all the other instrumentation in, like the metering, for example, in the camera? Do you still expose, like, do, can you still use, you know, your your meters to to expose correctly? Or how does that work? Kind of. I mean, so how, how, the, do you, how do you expose to infrared light? That's, that's kind of what I'm asking, I think. Um, well, the cameras are calibrated for visual light. But luckily, with the mirrorless wave that we have, um, you know, the mirrorless cameras are absolutely perfect for infrared photography because what you, you know, you're looking they basically through the sensor. So the metering system is not adversely affected, but it's not calibrated for infrared, which means that the meter tends to underexpose infrared. But that's okay, because we can just use exposure compensation and we can see, you know, the brightness and the intensity in the image changing. So that's wonderful. We can see it happen. Other than that, like your image stabilization, your lenses, everything else just works. If you're shooting on a DSLR, that's a little bit more challenging. You have to actually calibrate a lens or you have to um, use a live view feature, you know, to look through the look, actually look through the sensor. But no, it's 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 completely transparent for the most part, other than exposure. Exposure can be kind of wonky because the camera doesn't realize that it's sensitive to infrared light. So it tends to overexpose, maybe a stop. So I'm constantly setting exposure compensation. So you can still eyeball it because because you can kind of see the final image um, in the viewfinder oh, yeah. on a mirrorless. Okay, what else actually that makes it a lot easier? It's it's way easier. It, it, it's it's really actually wonderful. I mean, if if you ever if you know somebody or if you're interested in infrared, um, you know you can go online and you can look at all these images. Uh, you can see the black and white conversions. You see the faux color, which is where they've got like the pink, you know, foliage or yellow foliage and blue sky, whatever. But to be able to look through the camera. And to walk around and like point it at things, you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know grass could look like that. You know, um, the moon, the moon is a perfect example. I'm, I'm obsessed with chasing the moon. Now, during the day, we photographers, we know that high noon is not beautiful sunlight, especially in Southern California. I mean, you know, it burns everything, right? It's hot. But with infrared, you can point it around a scene and, and, you see these wonderful shadows and things pop out. And the moon, for example, <clears throat> the moon is set against this wonderful ultraviolet blue background, but it's lit by the sun, so it's infrared. The camera is sensitive to infrared and not sensitive to ultraviolet, so the moon pops out in the middle of the day when you almost can't even see the moon. So things like that tend to happen when you start to get into infrared and you're just like, oh my gosh, like I, there's so many things I can do with this. And how do you decide what your subject matter is going to be when you're, um, when you're shooting infrared? Is that, is that, is that something you sort of learned uh, with experience as to what looks good in infrared and what doesn't? Like for instance, could you do like, what, you know, what effect would it have on, let's say portraits? Like, let's say if you, if you shot a portrait of a person. So, so it's like any of our photographic skills, the more that we use them, the more natural that they, that they come to us. Right. So any of us that have been shooting for a long period of time, I can walk outside or I can walk inside. You could do the same thing, right. And look around and be like, this is probably two eight at, you know, 500th of a second at ISO 400, right? Like you, you have an idea shooting infrared is the same thing. The more that you walk around, the more you pointed at things, you're like, well, that's an Oak tree. 
you're not going to look beautiful in infrared, but that's a pine tree. That's going to look amazing in infrared. And, oh, there's a lot of grass and, oh, look at this tunnel and look at all these shadows. So after a while, you get used to that. Um, humans are very interesting because uh, it is not flattering, first and <laughs> foremost. It makes your skin translucent. So when I say it's not flattering, it's not flattering in the traditional sense, but people look amazing, I think, in infrared. But your veins will pop out in your arms. Your eyes go dark because there's no infrared light exiting you know, your eyes as much as it is your skin. So they can have kind of an odd appearance. Um, there's a, a good friend of mine and, and Fredericks. Uh, he's a member of TWIP, Craig Stampley. And he does a lot of uh, fine art nudes in infrared. And they're they're gorgeous. He does have to do a little work on the eyes to kind of bring some eyes back so they look natural and clean up if there's any like weird veins or anything like that. But they're just, they're luminescent, right? They're just, they're really beautiful. So yeah, there's a lot you can do there. Is so how much goes into the, uh, the editing afterwards, like the post-production with the typical uh, infrared image? So infrared is is interesting because when you get the image back, it's um, it looks all magenta. It's just completely magenta. And there's actually two color channels that are at work in there. There's a magenta channel and there's a cyan channel. The 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 those two channels are really strongly predominant in there and you have to get good at separating them. So if you're using software like uh, like Lightroom, you have to create a custom DNG profile. If you're using something else like a Capture One, um, you can just right click anywhere with the eyedropper and immediately you'll see two tones will pop out. And then you can start converting because once you get those two tonal separations, now you can create your highlights and your shadows and work through. It's not as simple as, oh, I'm just going to desaturate you or run you through Nick filters because that stuff doesn't work on infrared. I mean, it, you can get results. So initially, everybody just desaturates and plays with it. But eventually, you want to get deeper. It's it's a whole conversation, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not complicated. Yeah, it's it's yeah. not it's not complicated. It's not a barrier uh, by any means. It's not a barrier. How did you first get into um, shooting infrared? So uh, a friend of mine, uh, Ken Sklute, who is an incredible landscape photographer, um, he he had been shooting infrared for a long time and and i went to go visit him in arizona we went to um uh what is it saguaro national park and we were photographing the cactuses and he's walking around and he's photographing all these dead cactuses that i didn't think were very cool right uh, you know but he's he's amazing he was a canon explorer of light like this guy's good and i'm like can I, what, what, are you, what are you doing buddy he's like oh i'm photographing these guys in infrared and he showed me the back of the camera and i was just that is not there like like those tones and 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 that, those forms and shapes like i don't see those but you look at the back of the camera and i'm like what the heck immediately immediately i got home and converted a camera <laughs> <laughs> so can you convert any camera or does it have, is there like any anything you need to pay attention to um I think pretty much any camera that you can get to the sensor. So, you know, in, in the U S there's a company called Spencer's. There's a, there's another company called, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but if you look up infrared camera conversions, most of the websites, they will give you a list of cameras that they can convert. Uh, it's about 350 bucks U S and it's reversible by the way. That's really, that's a really stickler for some people. It's like, Oh, I don't want to convert a camera. Yeah. You, they just take the sensor. They just, take the filter out and they put the like there's a protective filter that goes over our sensors they put that back and you're good to go so that sounds pretty easy <laughs> have you ever yeah uh, have you ever had a camera converted back to normal i did yeah um so i converted a uh d850 and a d7000 and when i sold the d850 nobody wanted it as an infrared camera so most uh, websites or most companies will convert them back for like half price. So if it's like, if it's like 300 bucks to convert it, they'll do it for like 150 bucks. You just send it in, they take it out, they clean the sensor, they clean everything, they put it back together. So then I just, I sold the D850 unconverted. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I mean, you're an award-winning wedding photographer as well, by the way. Um, 
Have you ever shot a wedding in infrared? I always take the camera with me and I have shot many wedding images in infrared, but you know, not, not like a whole wedding. You just couldn't do it, but yeah, I take it. If the opportunity is there, if the moon is out, um, if they're in a golf course with a lot of greenery, a lot of beautiful trees, pathways, things I think would, would lend itself to infrared. Absolutely. Yeah. It's always there. It's always there. It's always with me. How does, I mean, I, I love the creativity in, in what you do. And th I think one of the uh, the things that sort of struck me the most, again, because I wasn't really sure what I was looking at, was was the whole your whole thing on uh, photographing kelp. Yeah. You know, it's like, how did you come up with that? Like, what is kelp? It's like seaweed, isn't it? Or something like that? It is, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's seaweed. It, that sort of stemmed from the early learning process with infrared. I, I was learning to see infrared and, we, you know, we would do road trips up and down the coast of California. We would drive across country and um, the infrared is my walking camera. Like if I'm going to go somewhere, I grab the infrared. I don't, I never take color. I mean, I have my phone, so why would I need that? Like I got that by, <laughs> and, I, and I remember, I remember being on the beach and, you know, you're just kind of like, pointing the camera around, looking through it, just trying to see what the world looks like. And I went, what the heck is that thing that's glowing in the massive grayness of nothing? That's right. It's like, oh, it's, it's kelp, it's seaweed. Because it's uh, translucent, it's gelatinous, it, the, the, the infrared light reflects out of it, but the, the water around it, it doesn't. So immediately it pops out. So... Then the journey is to find beautiful kelp. <laughs> How do you balance your work um, between, you know, shooting weddings and doing the fine art photography? I never stop moving um, and I don't sleep a lot. So I'm always <laughs> doing something. If uh, for a long time, I didn't chase personal work. I mean, I've been doing, I've been doing weddings uh, for over 30 years. And I, and I would say probably the first 10 or 15 years, like I never chased personal work at all. And I was really getting burnt out. And that's about 2004, 2006, seven, when digital sort of started to kick in. And I thought, well, this is kind of cool. Like I can, I can manipulate this stuff. I can do what I want. And so I just started carrying a camera with me when I was doing my personal stuff. Uh, I, you know, I like to do a lot of camping. I like to be outdoors and hiking and, you know, dirt bike riding and whatever. I always had a camera with me. And it's amazing. You know, you go for a morning walk across the sand dunes and you see these little cool tracks from like a stink bug. And you're like, oh my gosh, like I'm going to photograph that. So always having a camera with you, always just having your eyes open and being inspired by what's out in the world. That's, that's it. And it, it all kind of like eventually cascades into like, oh, I'm going to photograph ice in my, in my garage. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm listening to Metallica and sipping scotch. Yes. <laughs> awesome. I mean, that, see, it, that's really where I always think the beauty lies with photography, you know, the ability to be, you know, creative, to look around, around you in, in the world, you know, and, and pinpoint things that you think maybe that may make an interesting image, you know, and it could be absolutely anything. Um, right. and of course now we're at a time where you can generate all of that using AI yeah. at will with, you know, a really simple three word text prompt, right? Something like that. How do you feel about that? Oh, I'm excited about it. I think it's, I think it's amazing. Yeah, I am. I am super excited about it. I mean, I, I literally have mid journey, you know, and discord open every morning I get up, I have my tea, I check my email and I look at what other people are creating and I'm so inspired by it. I, I really am. I think it's, it's new, just like any technology, but I'm very inspired by it. It's also, it's a very divisive sort of subject, you know, depending on, depending on who you talk to, I think with anything that's, that's new and untested, you know, there's, I think for a lot of people, there's sort of an initial fear of the unknown, you know, which is sort of a typical human right. condition, I guess. Um, how do you, like, um, how do you sort of maintain your artistic vision when, you know, when there are tools like, yeah, and personal style, let's say, 
in an era where AI may, you know, come and compete with that? Does that does that make sense? Um. Well, I, you know, I'm, I may be fortunate that I'm not in an industry where I think AI is going to compete anytime soon. Um, I mean, I make my living photographing people that want to be photographed, where, you know, AI can't really do that. You know, you could, you could upload like a, um, a headshot and have AI make you a couple more variations of that headshot. So like for what you're doing, that might be some competition. But in reality, it's like fast food versus quality food when it comes to humans. Like they're like, oh, Kirsten, I need you to, I need you to do a headshot. I need you to make me look good. I need you to take off 20 pounds. And, you know, uh, AI may be a long time away. I don't think is going to do that. I think humans are going to want human interaction. So I'm not, me personally, that doesn't, that doesn't scare me. You know, I don't think that it's going to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, agree, I totally agree with that. Um, there's sort of, you know parts of the industry, like wedding photography, it's, you know, it's all about that particular day, you know, the special moment right. um, and capturing that, you know, as a memory. That's what it's about. I mean, just, I mean, event photography in general, I think you could say it's all about the actual event that's happening, right. you know, the moment. And I don't think necessarily AI will be a massive, you know, competition for that. Um, there are other things where I'm thinking like product photography, I can see that. Oh yeah, I can see that suffering, you know, due to the influence um, of AI. But at the same time, I always think, well, you know, I'm sure people had the same conversation when digital first arrived on the scene, you know, and the ability to manipulate your images in Photoshop, you know, started happening and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that any time we've, we've seen a technological leap, you know, when when the camera was first invented, you know, the the painters of the day felt that, well, there's no art in photography, you know, only painters are artists, like you just capture what you see, like you're not really an artist. And, you know, the technology has proven that to be very, very wrong. And it's also opened the doors for people who can't paint to create art, which I think is I think is super wonderful. And, you know, here, here comes along AI, here's this ability to sort of have an imagination and ask a, a an AI or a computer like here generate this image for me. Now, if anybody's ever tried it, it's not that easy. You get amazing images, but you don't get what you want most of the time. But I do think that it's going to allow people to be creative that maybe have a hard time with photography, maybe have a hard time with dealing with shutter speeds and apertures and lighting ratios and 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 maybe they have mobility issues or maybe they just can't draw, right? Like they can, they can create amazing things that are in their mind and show them to somebody. That's what art is. Like, I'm super excited about that. Because that kind of would have been my next question. You know, um, how do you see that relationship between, you know, creative photography and AI? Do you think it's, you know, AI enhances um, or detracts from the, the creative process itself? Well, I... I, I <laughs> It, it's a big question. <laughs> um, there's really two parts to that. First and foremost, AI is not photography. So I don't, I don't see it as competing in photography. I do see it taking jobs or taking, you know, clients that don't need photography now because they can generate, you know, a commercial scene or whatever with AI, but AI is not photography. So I don't really feel like that's going to compete with me very much. However, I think that we can use as photographers, I think we can use AI and we can use like a mid journey and, and, a, and, a, and a, a generation of images to inspire us. It's super cool to sit down and to generate a scene and play with lighting scenarios and then be like, God, if I could just put a bride in a place like that, like I would have never, I would have never come up with that idea. Or we can also use AI. I use AI a lot to to generate backgrounds or skies or, you know, things that I need to add to my images, not to completely change them. Although I'm okay if I change my images because they're art. But sometimes I need tree bark to get rid of graffiti that I can't easily remove. Or, you know, I want to put a couple ducks in the pond. I don't, I don't have ducks. <laughs> so I can use AI to generate those. Yeah. I, I, it's a tool. Yeah, I mean, see, I always, I always think, you know, the creative 
creative thinking or the creative process is is basically you know it's sort of a uh, it's a string of making lots of decisions you know if you think right. about it because you as a you know as a creator oop, one one second somehow what's happening now sorry apple mail has just decided to just launch itself for some reason how very bizarre i'm telling you there's things happening here <laughs> on this computer that are unreal okay, okay cool let me just ask this question again um i'll just make a quick note that i remove that okay um so i often think that when it comes to the creative process you know as a creator we simply you know we make a number of decisions that lead us to a desired result and sometimes that result is exactly what we had in mind from the start sometimes it's better than what we had in mind or slightly different because you know along the way we get inspired by this and that and something happens and you go oh actually that's better than what i thought originally you know and so we right. then you just have to carry off on a different path um and for me ai is really just another tool on that on that journey you know generally speaking right. and and also you know the other thing i find is that you know, when we talk of ai it's really such a wide subject it's such a huge subject you know because you know ai can mean well changing a sky well we've been doing that for ages you know right that's nothing new uh, or it can mean well using midjourney and creating an entire image just out of nothing that's sort of the other extreme and then of course like you said it's hard to call that photography it's probably not photography you know it's just art in general yep you know ai ai is just doing what i think some artists were doing just making it easier you know i mean i've i've got i've got friends that are great composite artists they're great illustrators they use pieces of photography to build scenes that don't exist now nobody ever looked at them and said oh shame on you for that like that that mountain and that that landscape and that, that you know that moon none of that stuff goes together like that's not no they're like ah oh, this is really great you created this great image well ai is just making that easier for me to take a vision in my head and create an image not a photograph um i think that conversations like this and dialogues like this are really really important because i think we need to come up with some new terminology and we need to as a community um come up with sort of like an acceptable standard so that when somebody posts an image that they don't call it a photograph when it was clearly not a photograph it was rendered will give you credit and high fives for for creating this amazing illustration and when it's a photograph and 90% of it is is artificially stacked and composited and that's not a photograph either right like you know we need to come up with with new terms and new dialogue so that the viewer and the other artists can appreciate it for what you've created the funny thing is i always think you know when you look at filmmaking for example none of these concepts are are in any way shape or form alien to the filmmaking process. And we're not necessarily right. even talking about CGI. I'm talking about like matte paintings. Like if you look at like the original Star Wars, for example, right? If you look, the, if you look at the behind the scenes shot, I mean, you know, they weren't really in the in Cloud City. They were like on a studio stage and, and you know, they're just walking, walking along this, <laughs> yeah. this, this ramp. Uh, everything else was just covered up by matte paintings, for example, you know, that's right. a way of compositing in camera. Uh, you know, uh, but you're doing the end result is the same thing. You're doing the same thing. You're creating a world that isn't really there, and and you're passing that off in inverted commas as as reality in in a way in order to make the story work in that particular scene, for example. Right. And in a sense, a, a photograph or an image, and this is where this is where ambiguity in language almost becomes a hindrance because there's so many words that we use for a picture, image, photograph, illustrations, and right. so forth. Um, some of these terms mean something very specific, like illustration, but in other words are very arbitrary, like image, for example, that can mean a million different things. And it means right. one thing to one person 
and another thing to another person. And that's, I think that's where the, that's where the problems are sometimes. Exactly. Exactly. And, and photograph is very, very, very specific. You know, yeah. a photograph is a very specific, definable thing, not just some term that, that we've coined and made very popular. Um, it is a very specific scientific process of capturing photons in a way, um, <clears throat> you know, so, and, and I do a lot of competition and we, I do a lot of judging and, and, you know, one of the conversations that we always have behind the scenes is how many pixels are you allowed to remove and replace with something that was never captured as a photon before we don't call this a photograph anymore. And, and that's always been a challenge pre AI. I mean, in the wedding industry and in, in a lot of wedding competitions, um, you'll see the skies replaced and you'll see streets removed and you'll see castles dropped in the background because we don't have castles in the US, right? Like, so somebody will add a castle and it looks amazing. That scene didn't exist, but they win national competitions. They get high praise and they call it a photograph. That's what bothers me, you know? And what I fear the most is that we don't we don't really tackle this and create those terms and create a um an expectation and then people will create fake images and call them real and put them out into a world where conspiracy theories and fear is real right and then people will believe them even if you tell them later that it wasn't real now they believed one moment they had that that rush of fear or anxiety or excitement how do you, you can't take it back. That's what I worry about because that is so good. And uh, anybody, almost anybody can do it now. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the thing, you know, back in the day, you, used, you just have to be an expert to, uh, you know, to composite things to, to a believable degree. Um, and, you know, just coming back to the castles you mentioned, you know, where I grew up in the south of Germany, it's the exact opposite problem. There's too many castles there. You're trying to, you're trying to take a photograph where there's no castle in the damn shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bloody everywhere, these things. Ruins. That's funny. <laughs> People complain they're ruining the landscape. It's just bloody everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we talk about like, you know, manipulation and editing and things like that. And, you know, AI made that easier. A lot of people like to, you know, speak to this idea like, you know, well, film, film was pure and film was honest and fi film was not film. I mean, you can go back through history and you can find back as early as like, you know, the mid 18, late 1800s where there's photographs, their lives, they were composited. They it was, wasn't any more honest. It was just harder to to do and, and identify. Yeah. And you know, very often you can look at some very famous um photographers that made it their style and their business to, you know, it artificially enhance the photo. I mean, Ansel Adams is a really good example for that. You know, oh, yeah, I mean, these images aren't captures of reality. They were massaged and made to look by design the way that the, the maker, the artist decided he wanted them to look. And that's, you know, ultimately that's an artistic process. You know, we, yeah. we do that every time we put, you know, a brush on a canvas, you know, we have a, we decide what it is that we want the end product to, to look. Right. But it's interesting you mentioned, um, you know, uh, camera competitions, for example, because I'm, I'm a member of a local camera club. And of course these, these conversations and these discussions, um, arguments, I would almost call them. Yeah. <laughs> oh know? yeah. Oh, they're, they're, they're heated, man. They're yeah, intense. Very. <laughs> You know, and it's, it really boils down to, um, you know, very exact definitions of, you know, of things and, and exact wordings, because of course in competitions, in a sense, you have to have rules and it's, it's quite difficult to, to come up with a construct of rules that e either includes AI or excludes AI, depending on what right. the agenda is. Yeah, in in our in our local organization, in our competition, AI is completely excluded. So much so that if if I look at one of your images and I know the Milky Way does not rise over that, I'm going to ask to see your raw file because you know, or or if I see a sky that doesn't look right, I want to see the file. I want to make sure you know, e even even using things like gigapixel AI and these others, like they, they actually add texture into certain things and stuff like that. Like we're trying very, very hard to draw the line in the sand 
And I think, I think it needs to start at local communities because two things, I want the photographers to be honored and respected for the images that they've created, that they went out in the world and captured and they sat and they waited for days or planned a trip to get the moon in the right place or the sun coming in at the right angle. I want them to be honored for that. But I also want the artist who has this crazy wacky vision that wants to bring all these elements together, use AI, use components, whatever, and create an image that I'm just, that I just love. I want them both to receive equal praise, but it only works if they're in their own category. And I think that's the key is, is categories because, because, you know, it's not a new thing. I mean, categories have been around forever, um, in, in camera club, uh, competitions, right. like a, a good example, you know, over here is maybe the same in the U S I'm not, not sure, but I guess it is. Um, nature photography is, is, is very simple. There's absolutely no editing to be done afterwards. There's no, you know, it's, you photograph nature as it is, and that's, that's the end of it. But there are other categories that are a lot less restricted, you know, where you can, you can, I don't know, you can photograph a river and artificially dump a fox in there if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a picture yeah. like that only recently, you know, that's yeah. not in nature. Yeah. That wouldn't, that's not going to fly in, in the nature category, but there are other right. categories where that's perfectly fine, you know? Right. Right. And, and, and that's, that's kind of where it comes down for me. You know, we have these conversations a lot with Frederick um, on, in his community and the photographers there is, is I, I really want artists not to feel constrained at all. If you want to go use AI, you shouldn't be shamed for using AI. Um, I want you to go shoot film and do whatever you want to do. But when it, when, when you share it and it comes to light, like, just be honest about what you've created. You don't even have to say it up front. Like, I'm not about like, oh, you got to label this like 10% AI, like, just share it as an image. If it's an image, if it's a photograph, share it as a photograph. And if somebody asks you, like, hey, did you really get 17 lightning strikes in that shot? Be like, heck no, I composited that in. And they would be like, great job. I can't do that. As opposed to, you shouldn't be asking me that. That's insulting. Like, come on. Like, it, you don't need to be offended because somebody asked you. And if you really did get like 17 lightning strikes, awesome. Show it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's, uh, these sort of conversations have, have been going on absolutely forever, you know? Um, oh, yeah. I, you know, one of the things I find a lot um, in, in this community over here, and I'm, again, I'm pretty certain it's probably the same over in the US, is that, you know, it, you very often come across this sort of sentiment that, you know, you have to get it right in camera. And if you don't get it right in, in camera, then you are not a, you know, photographer or whatever. Um, and, what I've always felt is like that, you know, what I do predominantly, um, it really requires a large amount of post-processing, you know, of, of editing and compositing. Oh, yeah. That is just because of the stuff that I do, especially there's a, there's a project, um, uh, called three ads in a row where there's quite a lot of compositing that goes into it mainly to enhance the story in it or, um, to create the backdrop in the way that I want it to be and so on and so forth. Um, and so my argument is always that, well, my counter argument to that is always that, you know, I shoot for the composite, like I shoot for the edit and therefore I also need to get it right in camera because I already know what the post-production process is going to be. And if I don't right. get it right in, com in camera, I'm going to have a problem further down the road. So I also have to get it right in camera, but just in a slightly different way from, right. you know, from right. And, else. and I'll, and, and I'll lean into that a little bit with Ansel Adams. Like there's two images from Ansel Adams. There's the um, moonrise over Hernandez. You know, it's one of the world's most popular photographs. And if you go look at that, that photograph was horribly exposed. Um, and there's, there's iterations over time that as technology improved, chemistry improved, paper improved, uh, Ansel, um, did tons of manipulation to the negative. He did tons of dodging and burning and manipulation to get that image to be as, as good as he could. No way was that in camera. No way. That was all, that was almost entirely post-processing. And then you have his, uh, half dome photograph where it's, 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 uh, is it El Capitan or half dome? I think it's El Capitan where it might be half dome, <laughs> um, where the, the, the face of the rock is like all, all dark and all the striations in the, in the, in the sky behind that is really black. And he shot that because he put a red Ratnay filter in front of the lens. 
that's that is not how you see it with your eye but that was how the camera captured it and then he manipulated it later so what you're saying is exactly where i think all this technology kind of comes together is that for some of us um post-processing is part of my creative process i need post-processing i get the best image in camera i can possibly get especially with my brides or my families like hide the trash can uh get a nice clear shot of the sky you know oh there's beautiful light i'm going to use that beautiful light and then in post i do what i can to enhance those things i'm not lazy about it but could be lazy and it's still okay right whatever your process is but post for me is very much part of my process exactly and it's also you know it's a massive part of the storytelling process because that's the other thing of course that's often forgotten really in in these sort of ai discussions is that ultimately you know, there's a large degree of storytelling involved in, in a photograph. And sometimes manipulating a photograph in a certain way just aids the the point of the story, you know, and the, and the storytelling right. itself. Like an example, I'll give an example. I did a shot with, uh, with Dave Williams uh, some time ago where, for context, the three heads in a row uh, thing is a thing where I basically shoot a triptych. It's three images of the same person. Um, uh, handling three different objects that they've chosen. You know, these three objects could be anything that, that mean a lot to them. So it could be something you know, one thing could be uh, something that relates to their profession, for example, into their job, what they do. Another thing could be uh, something that uh, reflects a hobby that they like, you know, an activity they like doing. And then the, and the third thing could be something that just means a lot to them. So the idea is that across these three images, we'll tell a story and we get, you know, we add another dimension to this to the subject and to this character that we see in the in the image, if that makes any sense. But so uh, one image that I showed with Dave Williams was basically, you know, he's a he is basically a travel photographer, Arctic explorer, you know, and I shot him in his like Parker, you know, dressed up, ready for the Arctic. And uh, he cho one of the things that he chose was a drone because he flies a lot of drones and he films a lot of stuff with drones and this drone photography and stuff like that. And so what I wanted, the, the photograph I wanted to create was simply like him uh, sort of backing away in almost like fear and trepidation from the drone that was hovering right in front of his face, right? Of course, I can't fly that drone indoors right in front of his face. That would be way too dangerous, right. you know? Right. But that's the little story in that photograph, you know? And, and so clearly there's a lot of compositing that has to go on in that image right. in order to tell that story. And, and so, you know, here it's, you know, it's the, the final outcome that basically sort of dictates the techniques that you have to use in order to get there. If that absolutely. Sense, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I, I know that, I know that the AI conversation is, is, is hugely debated and, um, I tend to find, and I hope that none of your, none of your listeners or watchers are these people, but being critical of something you haven't played with yet, uh, be careful of that. Like, I know there's a lot of people that are really critical of AI and they've never gone on mid journey and created an image. Like go, go create this, learn this. I, I can tell you that AI is coming. AI is here. Uh, this image creation through mid journey and such as like that. It, we've got to embrace it. We've got to learn how to use it, how to use that technology. And you might be inspired, you know, just like your shot that you're talking about, like with your drone, um, you may have a vision of a landscape, but you want a dragon and a, and a volcano in the background and you can't go photograph a dragon and a volcano, but you know what? Mid journey can generate you one and you can drop that in your image. And now you've created a piece of art that you envisioned. That's, that's wonderful. I think that's magical. I think that's exactly where that, that kind of falls in. So I'm and all for it. Yeah, and it allows you to tell the story that you had in your head, you know, and right. put that onto onto or into an image, you know. Right. Um, and again, you know, that's for me uh, the storytelling aspect is actually probably one of the most important parts of um, of photography in general, you know. And so, um, and I, personally, I find AI has the potential to be a really great tool to enhance that 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 um, you know that prospect just like cgi has done the same thing for filmmaking you know yes yes i know that's gonna it's gonna grate some people and i don't mean to be 
callous about it. But, you know, I have I I personally, being self-employed, have gone from shooting Hasselblad to 35 millimeter. Every transition was like, oh, you're you're not a real photographer now. You're shooting 35 millimeter. And then and then and then I transitioned to digital. Well, all my film shooter friends are like, oh, well, you can't be a real photographer if you're shooting digital. Right. And and now, you know, with the advent of AI and other technologies, um, we're seeing a bigger shift in the economy. And for me, because photography is becoming an easier uh, profession to enter, it's competing with my business and it's and it's really challenging me to shift. Right. But I I'm I'm OK with that. So if you're a carpenter, if you're a writer or if you're an illustrator and AI is challenging you and, and, and potentially threatening your job, get on top of that thing. Like learn it, master it, and figure out a way how to make it um, work for you so that, that 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 you can move on. Don't just get mad that somebody moved your cheese. You know, like it's going to happen. Like that's just, that's what happens, right? <laughs> it's, the industry changes. It's just life. Yeah, and it's forever changing, you know? I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, painters had, a, had something to say about, you know, photographers when the first cameras arrived they're like well you're not a real oh, artist because sure. you know and so it just you know and it goes on and on like you know 120 film to 35 mil well you know what were you not shooting yeah. on plates were you shooting on <laughs> film you're not a real photographer you're not mixing your own chemistry in a yeah. tent <laughs> exactly. with toxic fumes <laughs> you're not an well, artist you're not dedicated yeah you're not using t 20 minute exposures you're not a real artist yeah yeah you know, i mean it's it's uh, and it it'll I think it'll forever go on like that as well, because I think AI is just, you know, the next thing, but there'll be another thing in, you know, 10, 15 years, there'll just be another thing. I, I, I agree. And, you know, kind of back to, I think what we said earlier is that these kind of dialogues are so important because, you know, as we push the frontier of image technology forward, we're going to start to see challenging uh, aspects of that, right? We're going to start to see AI in our cameras. We're going to start to see, you know, AI, you know, what, like in your iPhone, your iPhone stacks like 14 or 15 images to make an image. Like it's, it's not, it's not that simple anymore. And we need the dialogue to define it. And we need the categories to define it, to put them in and, and, you know, fiction and nonfiction or in sports, you've got pro and amateur, you know, it, they're clearly defined and we're comfortable with that. Photography? We we don't we don't have those segments. We don't have those terms. We don't. It's kind of messy right now, and I think that's why people are getting getting frustrated. So, I just encourage everybody to just be calm, a little <laughs> zen about the conversation, have the dialogues with your fellow creatives, uh, because everybody kind of wants the same thing. We just haven't figured out, you know, how to do it yet, you know. Exactly. And you know, I always think, I always think, you know, if you don't want to use AI, nobody's forcing you to, you don't have to, you know, yeah. it's just in the same way. Like, you know, if you're like super old school and you don't want to use autofocus, I mean, nobody's holding a gun to your head saying you have to, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like, don't, you know, if that's, if that's the way you roll, fantastic, you know, awesome. Um, you know, yep. when, when it comes to things like, you know, camera clubs and competitions in particular, where, you know, where it's important that there's a level playing field and that, you know, everybody's playing, but it's placed by the same rules. It's important to have that conversation and to create a framework of rules that everybody is happy to abide by. You know, we see that right. in, in a number of like walks of life, like sports is a really good example, you know, and we've only recently, I mean, or currently, you know, there are discussions going on about, you know, well, you know, um, male and female types of sports. And what if, you know, somebody just has to, to change gender and like, well, how does that fit in with anything? And is that fair right. or not? Or, or what, what is the deal? You know, it's such a new concept mm -hmm. that everybody's right. just running around going like, you know, there's, there's strong opinions on one side, strong opinions on the other side. People just have to get together and, you know, work it out and, and come up with some definitive rules as to how we solve think. for it. And then, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Build on that. Yeah. Start, start somewhere build some rules, build some ground rules, build some understanding, build some honesty. And it might be, it might not be perfect. It probably won't be perfect, right? It's we're humans, so we're imperfect. And then we build on that, right? That's, that's really what it's all about is like, start with the dialogue, start with something, build on that, make those changes. 
And it might not make everybody happy, but like, okay, this is where we're going to start. We're going to draw the line here. And then you're going to move the line. We're going to draw the line here. And we're going to move the line. I mean, that's everything. That's every bit of technology, everything that's ever come along. You know, people used to be afraid of microwaves and TVs and radio waves. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. And every time now, there's you know, something new, like, you know, cell phones. Oh, my God. You know, we're all going to end up with, with brain tumors because we're talking to a, a wireless phone, you know. That right. hasn't that hasn't happened yet, <laughs> you know, and it's the same thing. And you know, I think for anybody listening or, or watching this on YouTube, um, because if you are listening to the audio version and you didn't know there is a fully fledged, fully technicolored video version over on YouTube, um, but you know, for anybody listening or watching, you know, if you if you feel like you you are threatened by AI, then just remember that AI is only a threat if you let it. You know, that's, that's really the thing. And nobody's forcing anybody to use anything. You don't have to use Photoshop if you don't want to, you know, you don't even have to shoot, uh, shoot digital. You can shoot film. If that's the way you roll, totally cool. 100%. Well, something for, something for everybody to consider that if you're coming into this industry or you intend to stay in this industry for a long time, um, never, I shouldn't say never, um, but pushing back against something is, n isn't usually not healthy, right? Like. Like you can't, you can't fight the waves, the waves are coming in, right? The best thing you can do is you can learn how to utilize them. So whether it it's AI or it was mirrorless or it was digital or it was film, like it doesn't matter. All the people who pushed against it, they went out of business. The labs, I remember when we transitioned into digital, the film labs thought this was a fad, they went out of business. Kodak didn't think that the digital image sensor was worth putting money into, put them out of business, right? This, so I, I, just for any anybody that wants to run a business in photography, AI is going to be there. Embrace it, learn it, understand it. It's kind of like computers. When I transitioned from film to digital, I had to dive into a computer. I had to learn how to do stuff. It's just the way it is. Or retire. Right. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, that's really it, you know, and uh, the industry is always going to change. Uh, I mean, your industry, the wedding industry is a really good example for that. You now, if you go back to yeah, the, lot. to the eighties, for example, you know, pre-digital, you know, um, pre-Photoshop and so on. You know, I remember talking to guys, I've talked about this on this podcast a number of times, but, you know, I remember speaking to a guy who used to be a wedding photographer on film, obviously in, in the eighties. And he told me he did three weddings a day, you know, one in the morning, one midday, and one in the evening sort of a thing. And it, he could do that because he would deliver one album with like 25 or 36 images in it. And that was it. You know, nowadays, oh, yeah. nowadays, just imagine, I mean, how many images do you deliver as a, as a wedding photographer? Potentially hundreds, if not thousands, you know? Yeah. The expectation has changed. Um, a lot my and, and in my business alone that if i push back against every new thing that came along um i would have been out of business a long time ago i mean you know you think about 30 years of business going back to god what would that be <laughs> can't even do the, the math quickly but um you, you think about like all the changes that i went through from film to digital uh the, the the big market collapse in 2008 uh the pandemic right like just and then just the challenges of the demand in a market and in an industry, um, you have to constantly change. You have to if you want to stay in business for a long time. You have to change, and AI is just the newest thing. That's all it is. It's just the newest thing, you know. When it comes to the world of photography, it's just the newest thing. Embrace it, play with it, love it or hate it, like you know, Coke or Pepsi you know, tapioca pudding or chocolate pudding, like whatever, just pick one, <laughs> That's just it. pick one. But, you know, in order to know that you don't like Pepsi, you're going to have to at least have tried it. Right. <laughs> because how would you know otherwise? You know, that's the thing. It's the same right, with AI. Right. I mean, it's, that's why, you know, I, I totally agree. You know, it's, it's definitely worthwhile, you know, giving it a shot. Um, you might find the unexpected, you know, and, uh, and find it. It may not be the same as photography, but it may actually be something that you might very well love pursuing because it allows you to be creative maybe in a slightly different way and that's the that's yep. the beauty of it you know i'm thinking you mentioned yep. the pandemic you know obviously as everybody who's been listening to this podcast knows by now obviously this this podcast is a is a, is in its entirety is a 
a result of the pandemic. You know, it didn't exist beforehand. And most likely, if it hadn't been for the pandemic, potentially it would have actually never come to fruition, you know. But right. it was because of the pandemic that, um, that, that you know, my friend Nick and I felt the need to to start something and it just happened to be a podcast, basically. You know, and sometimes when you're in a situation like that, you know, technology, for example, can just get you out of a hole because if it wasn't for you know, computer technology, technology as it is today, the internet, um, or the cameras, and what we can do with, you know, with with cameras in terms of video and and still photography and all the rest of it. If it wasn't for that technology, then, you know, it would have been infinitely harder, if not impossible, to even create something like a podcast. You know, back in the eighties, right. you would have had to like, you would have had to work at a radio station in order to do something like that, and that would have been only audio and not even not even video. Well, you know, it, it just, you know, I was just thinking like, you know, we're thinking about like how AI is taking jobs away, right? Like there's, there's a, those headlines are always in the news all the time. And yeah, we don't want people to lose their jobs. We want the economy to be, be strong. We want people to be happy. But, you know, it just sort of dawned on me, like how many professional newscasters or, you know, radio hosts are like those darn podcasters, man, they're just, they're putting us out of, right? And, and it, but it's true. Um, you know, podcasting has revolutionized the information world, right? Everything from what we watch for entertainment, for how we learn how to do things. I mean, it's changed everything. You know, our, our local photography group of photography groups around the world are struggling to get members to show up, to come into a place, to sit down with somebody and have them talk about business or photography or whatever. Why? Because they're going to go listen to, to Kirsten and Troy talk about photography. And that's that's good enough. So even even the things that we accept as mundane and simple and that we see all the time, they're competing with other industries. And it's just it's in, it's it's just a constant churn of of technology and competition and new thoughts and new ways of processing things. So yeah, and yet yeah. you know there are situations um, that are, that arise in life, like the pandemic, for instance, where that that might be very well be the savior. Like I remember, um, you know, when the right. when the pandemic first uh, first started, and of course, again over here in the UK, and I think it was probably similar in, in California, if I remember correctly. But here, you know, everything went into like dramatic, drastic um, lockdown pretty much immediately. You know, right. and uh, and so of course that was a problem for camera clubs because nobody could meet up anymore, and it just wasn't possible, right? right? And right. Uh, and I remember, you know, talking to the members of of my local camera club, and you know, the average age is a little bit higher. Um, you know, most people are a little bit older. Um, and it was like, all oh, right, okay, well, we're just going to have to, I don't know, we're going to stop it. You know, it's not going to, it's not going to happen for at, at the beginning, people thought maybe a couple of months, you know, and then turned out to be like nearly two years or whatever it was. But, yeah. um, you know, and I remember saying like, well, why don't we just do it on zoom? Like that could be done, you know? <laughs> and, you know, initially, Initially, it was sort of a lukewarm, lukewarm reception. I remember, you know, and there's probably maybe I don't know, maybe twenty people or something were like, "Okay, well, yeah, let's, let's let's see what that's all about," you know. And uh, and then because I was running that that Zoom session every week at the same time as we would normally, you know, meet up um, right. at, at the club, and you know, it just turned out to be this thing where everybody was stuck in a house, and you know, there was this one event that was happening every Thursday at twenty to eight. PM or something like that, you know, where they could actually hang out with their other camera nerd friends, you know, and talk camera nerdy stuff, you know, and of course then with Zoom, you know, you can actually do, we, it, eventually, of course, we had speakers on and, you know, and competitions and everything else. It was just not IRL in real life, but it was just simply on Zoom and it became quite an accepted thing after the initial you know, uh, I don't know, after the initial criticism. Pushback, yeah, yeah if, after the initial pushback. Yeah, exactly. It just took a little while for people to realize yeah. that it's really not as bad as they as they thought. And I think AI is kind of it's a similar thing. We're at the pushback, um, the pushback stage. 
Um, yeah. m- my wife always calls it the fluffy stage where every- everything has to get a little bit fluffy first. You know, people have to get a bit spiky and then, and then <laughs> everything's have chills out. Everybody chills out after a while, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody's a little bristly around it right now. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that we, you know, that, that when we talk about AI that I always think about that really doesn't get a lot of attention is, um, you know, like the chat GPTs, right? Like the text generation too. So, you know, we're not only looking at like AI challenging imagery, but we're seeing AI challenging, you know, writing, but it's also incredibly helpful, you know, for, for somebody who maybe isn't good at, at, at writing or spelling or comfortable Right. But, but that's also challenging people whose jobs are, you know, writing copy or whatever. Yeah. So you've got to figure out how to, how to use those things. So it's, it's, it's system wide, right? It's everywhere all yeah. the time. Exactly. And, what's and so, we need to dive into that. Exactly. And what's so frightening, uh, I think about that is, is the speed at which is, it has happened. You know, that's the other yeah. thing. It's, it's just been, nobody saw it coming or most people didn't see it coming. And then all of a sudden it just arrived and it just made a, you know, almighty loud sound. <laughs> there it was. Yeah. You just go, what the heck? Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, referencing a sci-fi geekiness, like I'm I'm probably more of a Trekkie than I am into Star Wars, but you know, it's like first contact, right? Yeah. Like AI is is really kind of like it's kind of like that first contact where it was like, what is this thing? What are, what are we looking at? Like, how how does this work? Like, why are you here? Like everything was fine without you, and now you're here. Yeah. Um you know, but I, again, you know, I just, I love the fact that we're having this conversation. I love the fact that we're talking about it and all these different aspects and how it ties in. Um, and th- that needs to keep happening. It, it, I mean, I can't stress that enough, you know, for what you're doing here is so great, but everybody needs to keep having these dialogues because that's how we're going to figure out how it works into our lives, you know, um, exactly. and, and using it. And what, you know, what is going to be funny is in five years time, we're going to be, you know, revisiting this episode. We think like, well, this is like, you know, it's so obvious now. (laughs) Duh. Yeah. But that's, that's just part of it. But that's how everything works, right? Like I remember when we first started shooting digital, I had a friend of mine that I had to teach him how to use a computer. I mean, I've always kind of been into computers. So, you know, because I used to build them for gaming and stuff, but I had to teach him how to use a computer and he was just livid. He was just so angry at the world for requiring him to shoot digital. And now he had to invest in those. I'm like, then don't be a photographer. Like, go do something else. Go continue to shoot film. You're not going to get any jobs, but, you know. Yeah, go be a hipster. (laughs) You can do that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Film will come back. It'll be popular. (laughs) And, you know, in in a weird way, I mean, there's there's actually some truth to that as well, because... um, because in a, in a weird way, of course, that is true. Um, because you can carve out a niche for yourself if you do things differently from the masses. You know, yeah. there there is something to be said um, about that. I mean, I always say, you know, my ultimate nightmare would be having to shoot a wedding on film. That for me would be like, <laughs> you know, if anybody said like, "What was your your absolutely your worst nightmare ever?" That would be it. <clears throat> You know, ruining somebody's special day because I can't be sure that I that I caught the first kiss. <laughs> you know, the first dance like, um, I don't know, Thanks, baby, I don't know. You know, um, and, and yep. yet I'm strangely, you know, I am strangely attracted to uh, to film. I personally really have. I mean, it's a weird thing. I've never, well, I have shot film back in the day, but that was to the extent of well, you know, you you point and shoot. And then you drop it off at the lab and then you get it back and that's it. You know, and that's yeah. really, that's, that was my involvement. Um, but of course, you know, my grandmother uh, was a photographer in the late thirties and forties. And my oh, dad wow. used to develop black and white film in our apartment in the bathroom, you know, and turn that into a dark room. And, and so I've always as been, as you do, as you do. Yeah, exactly. That's just what had to be done. And, um, you know, so I've always been around uh, film and chemicals and, and I remember the smells and, and everything else. And, you know, wet prints hanging up on a washing line, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah. then and even just the wonder of looking at that sh- that piece of paper, um, you know, in the in the chemical bath and, and all of a sudden these shapes appearing, you know, and yeah, and it's like very in a very ghostly fashion, all of a sudden it sort of comes to life and you go, you right. put in a white piece of paper and then all of a sudden there's 
there's actually an, a, a real image on there. And it's just that sort of fascination. That's always really fascinating me. That's very different in digital because you don't get that magic. You know, that just doesn't happen. You upload the image and boom, there it is, you know. Yeah, it's yeah, there time. is. The, having having learned on film, um, it's certainly a discipline that I think a lot of uh, professionals, you know, are missing. And although I never want to go back and shoot film again, um, I, I love I love my digital. I, it makes my life so much easier to to be able to decide in post whether it's color, black and white, sepia, whatever. Um, the discipline of going in and doing a shoot and knowing that you know at the time every time you pull the trigger is going to cost you a dollar. Every every trigger pull was a dollar, and I couldn't afford I couldn't afford a dollar, let alone a hundred dollars of wasted shots, you know, so you get really, really good at posing, lighting, getting that shot just right in camera. We talk a lot about doing that with digital, but everybody's still chimping, looking at the back of their screen, looking through a live viewfinder that's got live preview. Um, all of those things could be said, well, you're not a real photographer if you're not shooting on film and you're not costing a dollar like it's technology embrace it and yeah. move on if you get a chance to shoot film and play with it you should definitely give it a try um but I, but i will encourage anybody that that's going to go shoot film don't just shoot film and then scan it because you're really kind of cheating the process you have to stand in front of an enlarger and you have to shine light through that negative it changes the image but the process of doing that is so important to pre-visualizing your negative, your print. I mean, like, oh my gosh, like the whole process, you have to do the whole process at least a couple of times. Like just, you have to do it. You know, I love, um, and I've recently gotten into is, um, is Instax photography, like Polaroids basically. Oh yeah. I just love it. And what I love about it is I love the process. That's one thing, but I also love the fact that there's virtually nothing you can do after you push the button. You know, once you push the, the shutter yep. button, that is it. What you, you know, you just, that's it. You can't do anything to that anymore. And it's that sort of, um, there's almost like a, a degree of helplessness to that, you know? Um, and, and I've, I've really come to love that process. So. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's super simple. And it's, it's also not cheap, you know, because these, you know, insects, films, right. Polaroid films are bloody expensive. And you're talking, you know, it's the same thing. It's about a, it's about a dollar, you know, roughly yeah. um, per, per shot. And if, you know, if you get the lighting wrong or, you know, then, uh, well, let's just cost you a buck, you know? So. Well, I, I don't know if the Instax will do it, but I remember like the older Polaroids, they had, um, the emulsion was in between two layers of plastic. So I don't know if it's still that way. Uh, so what we used to do is we would get like these little tools and then you could manipulate it before it set. So we would go in and you could like, you could like manipulate the grass or the tree and it could like draw over it. And it would, it would create this very unique one, one off piece of art, right? Like that, that was it. Like yeah. th there was only one. <laughs> it yeah, was really cool. Insects, um, it works a little bit differently. I'm not sure whether you can do that. You might be able to do that still. Um, but it's it's different in the sense that you like shaking the image isn't going to make any difference anymore. That's that's basically. Oh no, that was gone a long time ago. Yeah. So um, so I mean, it's it's an interesting thing. Uh, there's also, I mean, there, there are easy ways to cheat with that as well because obviously, you know, it's digital technology has to seep into everything. Um, so with sure. the, ins the insects Evo that I use, um, you can either use it as an insect camera, which is great, or you can use it basically as an insect printer. So you can Bluetooth your phone to it. And then, you know, take an image on your phone and then print that out in the shape that's of the awesome. insect. You know, and that that's in itself, awesome. I mean, that's great because, because actually, you know, the lens in the insect camera is, uh, well, how can I put this? Not particularly good. <laughs> you know, so often you definitely get a better exposure with your, uh, with your phone. Um, but yeah, I use that thing all the time. Uh, every time I go out, I have it with me. Um, every time I go into London, you know, I take it with me. Um, every time I meet friends, I take it with me. I tell you, like, you know, a good example is, um, you know, only a few weeks ago, um, uh, Dave Williams and I went out with, with Steve and, and his wife, uh, Debbie. And so, you know, this it's, it's fun to, you know, when you hang out, you spend time together and then it's fun to 
well, you can take a little selfie of yourselves, you know, like a little group photo as a, as a little souvenir sort of a thing. And of course, yeah, you can do that on your phone and you can send that digital file onto somebody and share it and whatnot, you know, um, and airdrop it or whatever. And then people have it on their phone. But the reality is like, you know, that's just one of like a million photos on your phone. So you're not really going right. to, you know, it's not going to be something that, that you're going to be looking at for very long. So what I love doing is, is to print out a little Instax photo and give that to somebody. That's cool. You know, because it's, it's just, it's a little hard copy of a little souvenir that it just, because it's a physical thing, it just actually means a lot more, you know, than just an image on your phone. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And yeah I know, you know it's very neat. Yeah. And that's the beauty of, of, you know, printing and printed imagery and printed photographs and stuff like that. There's still, you know, after all these years of digital craziness, there's still something really beautiful about having an actual thing, physical thing in your hand. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like we didn't even get into, you know, like printing. I mean, my entire, my entire career, I'm, I don't make a living off shooting. I make a living off selling prints. I have to sell images. I have to sell prints, uh, albums, wall portraits, wall collages, you know, I mean, so I'm, I'm all about what's going to, what's going to look like on the wall. You know, we, we've only talked about like the creation process, right? Like, yeah. where do you generate images? But it's for me, it's all about like, okay, now I'm going to print it. And that changes everything too, by the way, right? Like tonality and tone range and color space and, you know, all the things that completely changes. Um, but, you know, being able to hand somebody a print or print something out or hang it on your wall. I mean, like, yes, everybody print everything and hang everything. Like just put stuff on your wall. It's great. Yeah. And there's something so special about that. You know, it's, it's just like handing somebody a print and, and seeing them look at that for the first time. This, this, it's like a really special moment. That's oh yeah, one of the things I love the most about portrait photography actually is, you know, when somebody sees the final product and they realize for the first time that they don't look like shit, like they always thought they did <laughs> <You know? Right. laughs> because now they're properly lit and posed and, you know, photographed and, and everything else. And it just really, it does so much to, you know, somebody's, um, self-esteem and self-confidence. Um, yep. it's just a beautiful thing to see that transformation, you know, in another human being. That's, that's one of the reasons I, that's why I love shooting people. You know, I, I tried agree. a little bit of product I... photography during the pandemic. Um, didn't quite have the same effect, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's not as inspiring. Um, you know, the, the, the human factor is, is one of the factors that I think that we need to sort of really focus on. I mean, regardless of what camera you use, regardless of all the technology behind there, when, when you're photographing, we're really kind of doing it for people. You might be photographing landscapes, but you want people to look at them. You want them to have that visceral relationship. If you're photographing somebody else, <clears throat> you want to be able to communicate you know, what, what, what they feel or what they're experiencing at that time, or, you know, like what you're talking about, like your headshots and things like that, you want to make them look good, make them be confident. You know, there's this whole human factor involved, you know, the, the background, even if you're creating images in AI, you know, you're going to show them to somebody and you want to, you, hopefully you get that, that visceral reaction that makes them feel good or whatever you want them to feel right. There's that human factor that we have to consider that often gets left out of you know, when we geek out on technology is like, this is the, all this media is created for somebody with eyes to look at that. That's it. Exactly. <laughs> you know, we have to look at it. Yeah. That's, I always say there's always, there's always a person in a photograph because somebody's looking at the damn thing. You know, that's, right. that's it. Right. Um, that being said, I think that's a, that's a great, uh, a great thought to to finish this episode on Troy. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Um, I love this conversation. It was uh, very inspiring, and uh, and hopefully, you know, for for those of you who've been listening and uh, you know were you were in two minds about AI, maybe that's uh, given you some food for thought, and you know maybe you you'll go and try it out before you know before you throw out the the bath with the bath water, whatever to say. Baby, baby with the bath water. The baby with the bath water. That's it. <laughs> Okay, folks, that's all for today. There you have it, one incredible conversation. But before we go, let me just recommend another episode that I think you'll like. Check out episode 135, 
seven best tips to improve your photography, featuring tips from some of the most legendary photographers of our time. I'm sure you'll love it. And for those of you who are listening to the audio version of this podcast, did you know that there's a fully fledged video version on YouTube with plenty of examples of our guests photography in full Technicolor? I may have mentioned it once or twice in this episode. All you have to do is go over to YouTube, search for Camera Shake Podcast, and you'll be able to watch all past episodes on there. And if you are on YouTube already, well, get in touch and leave a comment and remember to hit the like button, ring the bell and share with your friends. You can help us reach a greater audience all over the world. Once again, thank you for listening and watching and I'll see you next Thursday.